My name is Scott Sager. I'm the Vice President for Church Relations here at Lipscomb. I teach in the Bible Department. And this is a trip I get to lead every May for the university. It's an engagements course. You can find out more about it in Global Learning. We'll be going May the 23rd through June the 6th this year. Uh, we'll spend five days in Jerusalem and Palestine, then go up to the Galilee. Uh, we'll spend three days there, then we'll cross over into Jordan. Uh, we'll go to Jerish and Amman and Madaba and Mount Nebo, and then we'll go to Petra, one of the seven wonders of the world. We'll spend the day there, and then the next day we'll ride camels through the desert, spend the day on the beach at Aqaba, cross the Red Sea on a ferry, and then we'll take a bus ride to the place we want to tell you about today. Uh, we'll go to St. Catherine's Monastery that's at the base of Mount Sinai, and there our host is Father Justin, who is with us today. And so I want to tell you a little bit about Father Justin, introduce him, and then we've got three students with us, Marcos, Marco Aziz, May Hartness, and Kat Gaw, who will be interviewing him for us. Uh, but Father Justin, uh, you're a Greek Orthodox priest in Egypt, so you're either from Egypt or from Greece. Which one is it? I was born in Fort Worth. I grew up in El Paso, Texas. <laughs> so you're a Texan. Okay, so tell me a little bit about that. Where did you go to, where did you go to college? What did you study? All my family had been to Baylor, and that was my heritage, but something inside me said no, and I went to the University of Texas at Austin. And what did you study there? I majored in English, but then I became fascinated with history. I studied classical Greek, and that was my interest in the early church. And so from there, you became a Greek Orthodox priest? Yes. Okay. One small step at a time. It wasn't a big step. It was one thing leading to another. And in hindsight, you could say God was leading me, but that's not how it appeared at the time. It was exploring things, going by intuition, making one small step at a time. So I know, because we're friends, that you've been a priest since at least 1974. Is that right? That's right. So have you been growing that beard since 1974? <laughs> <laughs> it used to be a little longer. I think it gets shorter in time. So if any of our students think they have a really great beard, can they come get their picture with you afterwards today? <laughs> Fine. Okay, any of you guys that have a great beard and you want to come down here and compare, you can uh, have a competition with Father Justin uh, after we're done today. But uh, did anything, you're at St. Catherine's Monastery, did anything important happen around there? The reason everything is there is because that is where God revealed himself in such a special way, first at the burning bush to the prophet Moses, and then at the peak of Sinai when he received the Ten Commandments. And these are the cornerstone of so much of our understanding, our existence, and it's amazing to be living at this place that goes back to such critical events. It's the emblem of God's encounter between God and man. Well, I wanted you to see a couple of pictures, students, uh, just to find out about the fantastic students that have gone on this trip the last two years. Uh, the next picture shows when we arrive at St. Catharines and what it looks like as we enter. And then the next picture will show you a picture of the monastery there at the base of Mount Sinai. But one of the things we do on the trip is that we wake up at 1.30 in the morning. I think that next picture might show you uh, us as we begin our ascent. It takes us about three hours to climb to the top of Mount Sinai so that we can be on the top as the sun rises and we can read the Ten Commandments uh, up there. Show a couple more of these pictures just to get an idea, uh, just keep rolling through them, of uh, this is the chapel on the top of Mount Sinai and then these are some of our travelers over the last two years who have been there to greet the sun as it's uh, risen and uh, done the Ten Commandments uh, together. But uh, I want to turn the program over, and I think, Marco, you're going to get us started with a few questions, and uh, I think there's some slides that will go with those as well. So, Marco Aziz, you're up. So, um, I am, my name is Marco Aziz. I am a junior exercise science major here at Lipscomb. Um, I, my hometown is Nashville, Tennessee, but I was born in Egypt, actually. So, I'm, we're very blessed. I feel very honored to be here with uh, you, Father Justin. And so, the first question I want to ask is, um, a lot of us here don't have an idea or don't have a great idea what monasticism is or what a monastery is. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, St. Catherine's Monastery, what your routine looks like as a monk there? I think it was in the fourth century that you find monks deliberately going out to the desert to pass their lives in prayer and fasting 
And what's amazing about Sinai is that it has a continuous history going back to that time. We start every day at four in the morning with prayers, the stars are still out, and then the service lasts until 7.30 by the time the sun has risen. So the beginning of the day is spent in a long service. We have a short service at noon, we have vespers at four in the afternoon. The whole day is structured around times of prayer together. That's awesome. So is it, is it true that monks don't get a lot of sleep usually? It depends on how good a book you're reading. <laughs> and also, because the community of Sinai is so small, a lot is less up, left up to you. It's not so regimented as it would have to be in a larger community. So uh, if you're doing things that are tiring, you can take that into account. If you're reading a good book, you can stay up late and, and you tailor things to your own needs. That's awesome. So, um, but your day, your day does have to start at four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty early. Um, another question is, um, with the monastery being at the bottom of Mount Sinai, um, how many times that, or how often um, have you been at the top of the mountain? A lot of people go to, si to, to see the sunrise. And so there can be 400 people there. And a lot of people really like that because people are coming from all over the world. Everyone is praying in his own way and having a moving experience. But when you live there, you don't want to be with so many people. If you go to the peak, you wait until after sunrise, everybody leaves, and then it can be very silent. But my favorite thing is to go to the remote chapels that are in the area, and there it's absolutely silent, and you feel like you've stepped back in time a thousand years, and you're experiencing the ancient way of life there. That's awesome. Um, so one of the most significant parts about the monastery is the library. Uh, it's one of the most significant ones in the world. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the significance of the collection? How old are the books? How valuable are the books? We have 3,300 manuscripts. There's never been a time when the monastery was either abandoned or destroyed. So it's a continuous history. And it's been predominantly Greek throughout its history, but it's been the goal of pilgrims from all over the world. And all of that is reflected in the library. Uh, academics come there from all over the world to study. We have an ambitious program to photograph them with high resolution digital cameras. The first manuscripts will be online by the, end of, by the end of January this coming year. And we're trying to share the heritage. We want them to be available to scholars, but we also want people to understand that these are the tangible evidence of the spiritual heritage that is at Sinai. Are you able to pull up some of the library pictures? Yeah. <laughs> there. <laughs> the building dates from 1951. We stripped everything back to the core beginning in 2009. This is the library as it appears today. It is a much more beautiful structure, but more importantly, it is a more stable environment for the protection of these precious texts. And we are enclosing them in stainless steel boxes, a program that will take us some years, but then everything will be in boxes for protection. When students come, I was able to open several of the illuminated manuscripts to show them these great treasures. And then some of the faculty here who teach Greek were able to read the manuscripts for themselves. Thank you. It was so cool to tour the library while we were there. Um, my name is May Hartness. I'm a junior law, justice, and society major from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, while we were there, we got to tour St. Catherine's Monastery. And something that we saw was the location of the burning bush. Would you mind telling us a little bit about the burning bush and the significance of that event to the Christian church? Uh, we read about that in the ch third chapter of the book of Exodus, how Moses was tending his flocks of sheep and goats, and then he saw the bush that was burning, but the bush was not being consumed by the flames. And he drew near to see what this strange sight was, and God spoke to him through the burning bush, commanding him to return to Egypt and to de deliver the children of Israel from bondage to Pharaoh. Uh, there was a Saint Macarius who wrote a very, very beautiful homily that I often remember. He pointed out the fire that burned 
the bush without being consumed was the same fire that took Elijah from earth to heaven in a chariot of fire. It was the same fire that descended on the apostles on the day of Pentecost. And it was of this fire that Jesus was referring when he said, I have come to send fire upon the earth. So when you, when you live at Sinai, it's the opportunity to read these beautiful spiritual homilies and to have these uh, beautiful thoughts from the early church come alive in your own experience. Wow. And would you mind also telling us about this butterfly that we see on the screen here? <laughs> uh, we have butterflies every spring, and they were lighting. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard to photograph butterflies. They land, and they keep their wings closed, and they just open their wings for a few seconds. So I had to stand there with a the camera and be very patient and then take a lot of photographs. And I finally got some that I think were nice. And it's amazing to see the burning bush as a living, tangible object. When Egeria visited Sinai in 383, she mentioned the bush is still alive to this day and it's still even today. So it's amazing to see that and to remember the awesome events that took place at the burning bush. Thank you. And it's my understanding that there are the Bedouin people at Mount Sinai. Could you tell us a little bit about those people and kind of their role at St. Catherine's Monastery, what they do? When you visit Sinai, there's a Bedouin village nearby and many little outlying areas. And the Bedouin are Muslims, they speak Arabic, they are married but they trace their descent to the soldiers who built the monastery in the sixth century and were commanded by the Emperor Justinian to remain there and guard and protect the monastery. And that is what they're still doing today. So it's an incredible continuity. And when you read about the news from the Middle East, there's so many conflicts and so many what seem to be intractable conflicts that you think there's never going to be peace in this part of the world. But at Sinai, we have peace. We have an amazing respect and collaboration between the monks and the Bedouin. So Sinai emerges as an emblem of peace. Peace is possible, and it's a symbol of hope for our times. Uh, on the screen, you see a photograph of a, a copy of a letter that was dictated by Muhammad for the protection of the Christians and the monks in the area. Uh, this, the original was given to the Sultan Salim in 1513, so it is no longer at the monastery, but the monastery has copies. And the copies always have a hand as an emblem that Muhammad touched the original. And it is conditions to ensure peaceful coexistence between the Muslim rulers and the Christian inhabitants. And one person has said, these documents are even more critical today than they were in the seventh century because these are precedents for peaceful coexistence. That's really beautiful. That's an amazing message of peace. Um, so my last question for you, and you've already touched on it a little bit, is about the increasing use of technology at Mount Sinai and what is the EMEL project? The Archbishop is very talented. He came to Sinai in 1961 when he was still in his early 20s. He became the Archbishop in 1973, and now he's 84. So when he makes decisions, he brings all of this experience to bear. And many people who are very advanced in the spiritual life are adverse to technology. People who are very committed to technology often do not have the time to commit themselves to the spiritual life. And he's very unusual in being familiar with both. He's very committed to the prayer life and very experienced in the spiritual heritage of Sinai, but he's always looking for ways in which we can use modern technology. So it is under his supervision that we are photographing the manuscripts with high resolution digital cameras, Scholars see these as making them available around the world, but the monastery sees this also as protecting the originals because if we are sharing photographs, the scholars do not need to handle the originals. So it's, it's an important prospect. Uh, 
people take stable electricity for granted, and many things that cannot be taken for granted at Sinai. We have to have voltage regulators, we have to have UPS units in case the electricity fails. So there are many, many things that have to be in place to make this project possible, but it is proceeding better than we had ever expected, and in early 2021, we will have 400,000 images online. All of the Syriac and Arabic manuscripts will be available, and then we will continue to photograph the rest of the library as time and resources allow. That's amazing. Thank you, Father Justin. Um, my name is Kat Gall. I'm a senior marketing major from Brentwood, Tennessee. Um, and my first question for you, Father Justin, tell us about the oldest icon in the world, and what does it say to you? The oldest Christian art in the world is in the Roman catacombs where it was underground, where the conditions are sustainable, where many of these catacombs were closed and abandoned for centuries, and now they are open. But paintings on wooden panels are very fragile, and in Mediterranean climates, they don't survive. And so this is the oldest icon of Christ, and it is many people's favorite depiction. It is Spiritual, yes, of course, but it is also much more realistic than the stylized art that you see in later iconography. Uh, it was executed in what's called the wax encaustic technique, where you put the wax, the colors into wax, and you paint with the wax. And that is one of the reasons they have survived for so many years. But the verse that always comes to mind when I see this icon is the verse from the Gospel of St. John. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this full of grace and truth is what comes to mind when you see this icon of Christ. Amen, thank you. Um, next question, tell us about prayer in the basilica. So when did people begin praying at that site? It's very moving to be in the, in the church which has been added to and decorated all through the years, but the basic structure is intact from the year 550. And so many saints have stood and prayed at the same place, and then when visitors come to Sinai, they feel this amazing continuity that we join our prayers to those that have preceded us for so many centuries. The focal point of the church is the apse mosaic, which depicts Moses the burning bush, Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, and then the transfiguration of Christ. And these are the same depictions that have been seen by so many saints through the centuries, even to our own day. At the beginning of the service, the whole church is dark at four in the morning. But then when the sun comes in, the whole mosaic comes to life, and it's a very beautiful and inspiring experience. Well, we want to thank Father Justin for being with us. He's been here the last couple of days. And uh, what happened was that uh, he's hosted us the last two years at the St. Catharines. And I told him if he ever was coming back to the United States, we really wanted him to come to Lipscomb. He's in uh, to go to New York in a, about a week where they'll have a big conference about the way that they're putting all these manuscripts online. One of the things we don't think about is that in Acts chapter 2, at the birth of the church, one of the languages that's mentioned there is Arabic. And so, from the very beginning, there were Christians speaking Arabic who were followers of Jesus Christ. The Gospels have been written in Arabic. A lot of the important uh, documents are in Arabic. And what they're doing is they're putting all these online to make them accessible and to make sure that people know that Arabic and Syriac and some of these ancient languages included Christians who are telling their story again now thousands of years later. And so that's what's uh, the project that he's a part of, and uh, that's what's brought him our way. But he's been a blessing to us, and uh, he's been a blessing to those who have traveled. Uh, in just a moment, uh, Richard Good's going to come up and talk a little bit about the Desert Fathers and close us out. But I wanted you to know that uh, Father Justin and I will be going over to Bison Cafe for lunch uh, after chapel, and uh, we'll just be sitting with you guys. And so if you have any questions or if you want to ask him anything, he'll be available to you. Uh, that's a joy for him, and uh, we will enjoy that. But I want to thank Marco, May, and Kat. Would you all give them a hand for uh, helping us out with this? And then uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Richard Good up, who teaches a class on church history and iconography. 
and uh, was a real blessing to our trip this year. Thanks, Scott, and thanks to Father Justin for being with us, arranging his travel schedule to come to town and to, to be with the Lipscomb community today. I think one of the things that we get to celebrate today is the living tradition of what historically is referred to as the Communio Sanctorum, the communion of saints. Uh, and that is a, a rich and deep tradition. And one of its meanings is that God has created our body and invested a variety of gifts to our community. Um, we sometimes will focus on the obvious, those who are gifted in particular ways, um, luminaries, people who show up in our news feeds, people whose names are trending, you might say. But it is also right and good to honor the gifts from all parts of our collective body. And so the quiet and the contemplative they too are critical for our bodies thriving. They too are integral to our history and to our identity. You know, about 1700 years ago, the Christian community was, was making connections with the power of the Roman Empire. And at that moment, some folks, because of the calling of God, broke with convention. And instead of moving into the centers of power, moved out into places like the desert of Syria or Egypt and surrounding regions. I think maybe to us today, the idea of, of breaking with convention and moving out from society and into the desert can seem, I don't know, shocking, um, a little odd. Why would they do that? And the short answer is the call of God. It was the vocation to which God had called them. In the tradition of Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, Paul, Jesus, the desert was a place for focusing. It was a place of trial. It was a place of clarification, purification, and intense communion with God. So instead of subscribing, if you will, to the complicated, often distracting list of things to do in our world, their calling was to go out and focus and create relationship with God alone. Here, the daily cycles of prayer and contemplation, simple labor, ordered the rhythms of life rather than those harried quests to run the world in those very popular and impressive and often praiseworthy ways. The cost of this desert tradition, this desert vocation, and keep in mind that every calling, every vocation comes with costs. The cost was humility. It was self-emptying. It was a silencing of the ego, which meant that life would often be lived in slow, small, still, and frequently solitary ways, where one died to the routine cadences, the definitions and demands of the world. They were different and they were called to be distinct. And as these desert mothers and fathers were called centuries ago, today God endows some with a vocation of discreet silence or enduring contemplation. Like Father Justin, as they honor their calling, these contemplatives love God, and serve the body well. I'm going to say a prayer uh, to conclude us, and then at the end of that, I would ask that together we read our journey statements. So let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you became poor for our sake, that we might be made rich through your poverty. Guide and sanctify, we pray, those whom you call to follow in the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. We pray especially this morning for St. Catherine's Monastery. We are thankful for the lineage of individuals who have, over the centuries, practiced their discipleship there, and for those whom you call to carry that vocation forward into the future. We ask a special blessing on Father Justin, both his travels and for his life and work in the Sinai. We pray that by their prayer and service, they may enrich your church 
and by their life and worship they may glorify your name. For you reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us read our journey statements together. Let's stand. I am part of a bigger story. I am important part of this community. I am loved, I am equipped, I am not alone. Go in peace. <laughs>